Okay, transmitters act as sensors only. The receiver controller provides the linkage output functions. The receiver controller can be adjusted to throttle its output across a small portion of that 3 to 15 pound stand. It takes both the transmitter and the receiver controller to be a complete control system. Wes? Yeah, you know, I'm good with that pretty much. That's okay. all. We'll get yeah. more detail That's later. Good. Yeah, and then this just happens to show a picture of a receiver controller. And then let's go on and take a look at, this shows a couple of different receiver controllers. Uh, this happens to show that there are um, at least four models of Johnson controls, and they come in single input um, standard proportional models, single input integral models, dual input proportional, dual input integral. Um, any comments on this, or should we go on to? Just that the, the slide's a little busy there, and uh, the green numbers represent model numbers. So, for example, the units on the right, there's two units there, one on the top and one on the bottom. Uh, generally, you'll, you'll find that these are referred to as either single or dual input receiver controllers. Uh, single input takes one variable and uh, outputs that uh, action. A dual input normally we see used in reset controls, so that it's looking at a second variable, typically outdoor temperature. So in the winter time, the colder it gets outside, a dual input receiver controller would take that information of the fact it's getting colder outside and make the hot water warmer or hotter. So to compensate for the coldness outside, it makes an adjustment to bring the water temperature up. That's all. OK, let's just point out a couple of items on this particular receiver controller, and then Wes will talk a little bit about the calibration. We have the different output connections on re removable connectors on the, on the left side here. That includes both the output and supply. There is a fan control here, or I should say a uh, little convenience port, since th this goes to the fan that can be used as a PE switch to turn a fan on and off. Below that, you see the little tubing, and they are put in different positions, whether you want the receiver controller to be reverse or direct acting. Master, not used in this particular model, would be your second input. The control variable is now where you hook up your transmitter to. This is the first input. And then this is the next one is a remote set point that can be used to remotely uh, change the set point adjustment. Um, there are only two adjustments on this that typically you will be using. They are going to be both the gain and then the set point itself. And I think Wes is going to go through and explain to you how you would typically set up a receiver controller. Wes? Um, in taking the example of a single input uh, receiver controller, uh, if you were to have a receiver calibration kit, you could actually calibrate a receiver controller uh, in your shop or on a bench prior to the installation. So when you get to the installation, the receiver controller would already be calibrated, and you can run with it. However, a single input receiver controller can also be calibrated in the field. And while that's being done, we would call that the um, ambient uh, adjustment, meaning that you look at the present ambient temperature in the room and calibrate it based upon that. So the first step we would take is to set the controller for either direct or reverse action. Next, we would look and see where that internal restrictor uh, lies, whether we want it included or not included from the system. If we want it included, we would set the internal restrictor to being open. Next, you would determine and set the proportional band. In this case, we call it the uh, gain adjustment. Gain adjustment and proportional band would be uh, determined by a mathematical equation. It's simple. You would use two items. Number one is the throttling range. That is, how far do you want the temperature to swing between the output of 3 to 13 pounds, temperature or pressure or humidity. And the second item is, as we discussed earlier, that 50, 100, or 200 degree sensor span. So those are the two things that go into determining what the proportional band is going to be set at. So you set that. Uh, next, you would measure what the ambient temperature is. Next, you would adjust the branch line pressure to 8 pounds out. 
next. That basically, that's done. So next, all you're doing is verifying that what you've done correctly. So next, you would manipulate your set point dial to read or agree with the value of your controlled variable or ambient condition. And then when you manipulate this set point um, dial, the uh, output pressure doesn't change, meaning that different manufacturers have different way of setting the set point on. Um, in this case, it's done with a screw, and you can loosen the dial and manipulate it to the present temperature. Uh, in the case of Honeywell, that dial comes completely off in your hands, and you then put it back on to the present uh, set point. In the case of uh, Siemens and Robert Shaw, their set point dials are kind of spring loaded, so when you pull it forward, it releases from being engaged with the uh, output pressure dial, and you can manipulate uh, to the uh, present temperature. So various manufacturers have their various ways of doing it, but the end result is all the same, so that when it finally, you're finally done, your set point is the present temperature uh, in the room. And at that point, again, we're sending out 8 pounds, and that represents the midway point between 3 and 13 pounds. The downside to using the ambient method is that your variable may be constantly changing while you're doing these adjustments. A calibration kit, as we mentioned earlier, allows you to simulate your variables with varying pressures. And finally, the calibration kit is the only way to calibrate a two-input receiver controller. Two-input e receiver controller, you could not, uh, determine, you could not set that up uh, by yourself without the uh, the addition of a, a, a kit. Thank you. That's the uh, next slide. Okay, we're running, I know, a little long on time here, so we're going to mention just that there are a number of other auxiliary devices that you may come across. Uh, many of these are going to require a full 25 pound or whatever your mass main supply in are. The most common are the reversing relay, which takes a signal and just completely flips it around. Zero pounds in gives you 20 pounds out, 10 gives you 10, and 20 pounds in would give you zero pounds uh, decreasing. Um, another one would be a booster relay. This gives you a one-to-one -one, uh, just tracking uh, thing. So a three pounds uh, in gives you three pounds out, but it has a higher volume. There are sequencing accumulators. This gives you a little bit of an offset. So if you wanted to have multiple valves in a line, if you had a one-third, two-third steam application, and they both had the same spring range. You may want to screw one of these in and start one valve first versus the other. Uh, we're showing an averaging accumulator here. This takes uh, up to four devices and gives you the average pressure value. And then there are signal limiters that um, can either impose a high signal limit or a low signal limit so that you may want to maintain a minimum outdoor air position for, on a damper or so. Um, so there are a number of these things. Um, Wes, any particular comments on just these auxiliary devices? Uh, a couple things. Uh, one that discussed here, these are mostly uh, modulating or varying output devices, but in pneumatics we can have devices that are simply a two-position control. And two of the more common ones that come to my mind is one is the, we call it the EP switch. Looks like a little three-way valve with a coil attached to it. So this is an electronic device or electric device that when interlocked with a fan so that when electric representing fan is applied to it, it sends main pneumatic air directly to an outdoor air damper or a minimum air damper to open that damper and allow the heating or cooling process to begin. So here we're mixing electric and pneumatic, uh, but in that case it's a two-position control. And the other one that comes to mind is just the opposite, a pneumatic to electric device. So I'm sending a pneumatic air signal to a switch, and it is an electrical switch. And when the pressure reaches a or falls to a certain point, I close the uh, single pole double throw switch, and it may start, for example, an electric uh, reheat strip heater. So, um, it's very versatile with these, uh, with the addition of these uh, additional devices. That's it. Okay. So. I